Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. In the name of Allah, the most merciful, we start and we ask Allah to send His peace and His blessings upon the Prophet of Allah, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Brothers and sisters, after the disbelievers, not necessarily after, because I told you it's not in specific order, you might find different stages happening, but whatever, as I promised you throughout the whole series, whenever I say the Prophet said this, the Prophet ﷺ did, did that. It comes from the authentic references, inshallah. Fair enough, and I'm doing my absolute best to maintain that. May Allah forgive us for any shortcomings or for not being very uh, exact word for word. May Allah forgive us. I mean, So the people of Quraysh, accusations and mockery were attempted. Family intervention was attempted. At bribery was attempted. Then they, then they would gather another attempt to stop the message from sp spreading. And what was the common thing that they came with? It's time to go persecution. Go as physical as we can go. So focus with me because this is an important point. The higher the status of the one who converts to Islam, such as Abu Bakr is a high elite family. Muhammad, peace be upon him, is from the elite. The elite will try to go as far as we can with insult, as far as we can go with persecution that we can get away with without the other tribe seeking revenge. That's the equation. The weaker they are, the Muslims, the more physical we will go. The ones that have no backing, deal, deal, all right. Of the things that they do, brothers and sisters, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam one time was praying in front of the Kaaba. And then the leaders of Quraysh, the tyrants, the arrogant, the ones who recognized the truth and they yet rejected, they were sitting in Abu Jahl, one of the toughest and worst of enemies of Islam. He proposes an idea. That's his proposal. Let's throw filth at him while he's praying. Abu Jahl said, check out this murai, this show-off. This Muhammad show-off guy praying in front of everybody, seeming so righteous, so religious. This show-off. Who amongst us can go to the other tribe that slaughtered a camel recently? Go grab the dung, the abdominal, the filth from that camel and walk all the way to Muhammad. And the moment he goes all the way down in prostration, Dump it all on him. All that filth. Who's up for it? So Uqba bin Abi Mu'it, he says, I will go for it. Uqba, the elite, you will personally go grab the filth, the abdominal, the dung, and the blood. And with your own hands, ruin your clothes and the smell and go and wait till Muhammad prostrate. And then dump that on him. Is that how much hate you have? Didn't go assign a slave? That's how much hate. May Allah allow us to be people of love, people who are wise, whom we hang out with, whom we distance ourselves with. May Allah guide us to the, have the right emotion and reflection. Amin. But he had hate towards the man who deserves all the love. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he goes, grabs that filth, and walks and walks and walks from the other neighborhood, other tribe, until he waits for Muhammad. Muhammad is praying. He's waiting. It's heavy. Camel body parts? Filth? Blood? Dripping? Okay, now. Now. And he dumps it all on his back. Dumps it all on his back. And the prophet stays in prostration. Surely disgusting and filthy. Imagine the blood and the filth. And the people of Quraysh, they laugh hysterically. Ha, 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 look at him. Look at that loser. They were laughing so much so they had to lean on something because it was so funny. They're about to fall. Look at him. Wow. And, it, and the believers saw that. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he says, I saw this happening. I couldn't jump in. I want to go and lift that field. But if I walked in, I'm going to be dead. I'm going to be done. If this is happening to Muhammad from the elite or so, what would happen to me? I have no family backing. I'm not coming from a high-end family. So he says, then someone ran to the house of the Prophet. Ran. Knock on the door. Fatima, Fatima. Go see your dad. Fatima, beautiful little daughter, about eight years old. She tas'a. She runs and she sprints all the way to her dad. And she sees all that filth. 
and she gets emotional and she cleans up her dad's back, cleaning up all that filth, then that girl, she walks to Abu Jahl, walks to Uqba, and she curses at them. You're such and such. You did that to my dad. And for the first time, from my understanding and from my research and from what I learned from the scholars, one of, if not the first time, the Prophet will raise his hands and pray against them. Throughout his life, he prayed for them. Do you know that the Prophet, by name, prayed for the guidance of Abu Jahl? By name. Are you guys with me? But how much do you forgive? How much? One of the people they suggest, between humanity, besides the Prophet's level of mercy is beyond, far and beyond. They say one of the things to make you watch out about forgiveness, like until when? If your forgiveness to the person increases them in oppression, you might need to recalculate when to forgive and how to forgive. If your forgiveness to an individual increases them in oppression, they need to watch out when to forgive and when not to and what to say. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, they threw all that filth on him. He raised his hand. And when he prays, he prays thrice, three times. Allahumma alayka bi Quraysh. Oh Allah, destroy these people of Quraysh. Oh Allah, destroy these people of Quraysh. Oh Allah, destroy these people of Quraysh. Then he names them, name by name. Oh Allah, destroy Amr ibn Hisham, Abu Jahl. Oh Allah, destroy Uqba ibn Abi Mu'it. They said, the narration, they were laughing, their laughter faded away. Oh, because they feared that what he says will happen. SubhanAllah. And then he walked away, Prophet. ﷺ. What in the world have you done in your life? Or what have you gone through that will make us question God and not be steadfast? Why am I asking this question? The Prophet continued the message. Allahu Akbar filth and so on and so forth i was here in this state and i went to work one day and under my keyboard here a big corporate job at a, co a big corporation and there was a document upside down and i lifted the keyboard looked at the docu document and it's about how muslims did 9 11 and terrorism right at my cube what do i say oh listen bro i can't handle this bro Alas, that's it. I'm going to call my name something else. I'm going to do this. I'm going to renounce this. People no longer say salam because it's an embarrassment. What do you mean it's an embarrassment? Yes, hi and good morning is fine. Great. You should go for it. Good morning, hi, whatever. But don't not say salamu alaikum, peace be upon you, in Islamic greeting because you're embarrassed. The Prophet kept going. Brothers and sisters, Abu Jahl, look what he does now. Abu Jahl says, let's step on his head if we see him praying again. He says, Wallati wal -uzza. Abu Jahl, not done. He wants more. He says, I swear by Allah, an idol, and an Uzza, another idol. If I see Muhammad praying once more, I'm going to step on his head and crush it. And Abu Jahl was big. Some people were so oppressive towards their religion, and they were very physically strong, like Abu Jahl, like Uqba. And there's other disbelievers at that time, at that time, who were very offensive to Muslims, such as Umar bin Khattab. No one was spared from these people. Umar bin Khattab, he tied his own sister, Fatima bin Khattab, in an authentic narration, and his brother-in-law, Saeed, shackled them, all tied up, and we'll mention that. Wow, what's going on? Is it because of saying, La ilaha illallah? That's all we're doing, we're not fighting. We're not pulling swords and I'm going to kill you, nothing. I'm just conveying the message, that's all. You don't want to hear it, it's up to you, but don't stop me from conveying it. That's the whole point of the Prophet and the Muslims. I just want to convey the message to this person. You don't want to hear it, I'm not coming to you anymore, I'm going to the other person. But they will come and stop him. May Allah protect us, Amir Rabbil Alameen. So then Abu Jahl says, if I see this man praying in front of me, I'm going to step on his head. Brothers and sisters, right when he says that, Muhammad وسلم, walks, وسلم, and he's about to pray, Allahu Akbar. And he prays and he prays and he prays until he reaches the prostration. Abu Jahl comes strong, physically powerful. He comes and comes. And I'm trying my best to imitate how he did. Ready? He comes, he comes. He wants to step on the Prophet. He comes and he did this. People are like, are you crazy? You're doing, oh. Then he start running. 
What in the world was the authentic narration witnessed by the enemies and those who are the believers? He said, what happened to you? He's like, when I was coming, there was a ditch full of fire. And there were people like with wings surrounding him. Oh, I'm not going to get a second step closer, another step closer. That's why he saw the prophet finished his prayers. And he told Abu Jahl and told those around, لو دنا مني خطوة. If Abu Jahl took one more step, not step on me, one more step towards me, the angels would have torn Abu Jahl limb by limb, body part by body part. Brother, can I ask you a question? Why did this happen? Number one, if you ask, you ask with respect. And ask out of curiosity and to see if there's wisdom behind it. But not to ask and question, why did he save him here and he did not save him here? Yes or no? Like why? When the scholars look at this, they say, when the prophet had the filth thrown at, the, at him, it was tarbiyah. It was nurturing. It was upbringing to the believers. If the greatest man on earth, Muhammad, is facing that level of hardship, sallallahu alayhi wa and he yet withstands it, then you should also withstand whatever you face. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. What about this? If this was tarbiyah, nurturing, and upbringing, this was tathbeet. This was for the people with perhaps weakness in the heart to strengthen. If God wants to protect someone, he will protect him. He will protect her even if the, all the enemies and the strong ones are on the other side. Allahu Akbar, the beautiful balance. So let Allah decide. May Allah grant you all paradise. Say ameen. If this what the prophet went through, can you imagine what the weaker ones went through? Can you imagine? Brothers and sisters, Saeed and Fatima from a noble family. I just shared that with you. Umm al-Khattab, he shackles them. He overpowers both of them, torturing them. At that time, Umar was not a Muslim. Not just that, family of Yasser. Yasser, the father. Sumayya, the mother. Ammar, their son. All from being kicked to being put into water till they almost choked to death and they released all what they want. The Quraysh, the Kuffar, the disbelievers, the arrogant, the tyrants is one word. One word to utter from your mouth that you renounce your faith. And we will let go of you and you will never be tortured again. That's all what we want. And the people steadfast. Steadfast to the extent that the Prophet, peace be upon him, one time he was walking along with Uthman bin Affan, may Allah be pleased by him. And they passed by the family of Yasser. Yasser, Sumayya, Ammar, all suffering, hung into poles and being whipped and tortured. And then the Prophet, he saw that he got hurt. Yasser, he sees that in the Prophet. The Prophet is in pain for what he's saying. So Yasser tells him, Ya Rasulullah, Addaru hakada. Oh, Prophet of Allah, this is life. Ya Allah, this life is a test as you taught us. You want to pass that test. You see the peace and the contentment in the heart in the midst of that whipping, in the midst of that torture. Yes, it's painful. Yes, they can cry. Yes, they can feel sad. But there's a sense of deep in the heart tranquility that they're trying to destroy them. They tell them, you can destroy my body, but you can never destroy my soul. And that's what they lived by. And if that's what happened to Ammar and Yasser and Sumayya, oh, what happened? Oh, oh, Ammar, what did he do? He, re he lets go of Islam. You serious? Yeah. He cries, he's devastated. But then Allah reveals verses in the Quran. He says, Allah will not hold accountable the ones who leave Islam just verbally when their hearts is full of belief. Are you guys with me? But some believer, they said, no, 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 I will never let go. And you know who never let go? You never who never let go? The mother of Ammar. Here she saw her son. She's an old lady. And Abu Jahl and torturing her and ruining her and slapping and smacking and insulting very bad vulgar words that I may not want to say here. May Allah protect us and shaming her. And she believes in Allah. Nothing can shake her. Abu Jahl is so angry. This woman is so stubborn. He looks as an he looks he has an embarrassment that look what a woman who is quote unquote weak look what she's doing to you yes you're physically abusing her but she's much stronger than you yes or no even in the eyes of disbelievers Abu Jahl gets so angry and Sumayya becomes so steadfast Abu Jahl gets so upset Abu Jahl grabs a spear a spear and he places the spear in her place of chastity and she dies 
and she becomes the first person who dies for the sake of Allah amongst the believers. The first one to pray next to the Prophet was a woman, Khadija. The first one who gave up her life for Allah is Sumayya, a woman. For our sisters and our brothers, you want role models? You want to know what's the best people to follow? Footstep by footstep, you hear got, got two names, Khadija and Sumayya. First martyr, and that shook the city. Ammar saw that, Yasser. It's tough. And they went and they tortured brothers and sisters. May Allah keep us steadfast. Say, Amin. Some people may like, where is Allah's help? Where is Allah's help in all of this? This is not just a question that some of you may think of. This was a question. Some companions came to the Prophet in authentic narration and they complained. They complained and said, Ya Rasulullah, O Prophet of Allah, do you not see what we're going through? Torture? Khabab, a wonderful man, but he's just like asking, like, you don't see what's going through. He's like, Ala tastansir lana. Can you ask God to like help us out? Obviously, the Prophet has been praying this whole time. So the Prophet, you know how he's like merciful, kind, all that stuff. And, and rarely does he have these moments, not as common, where he just gets angry. This was one of the few. He got frustrated. He got so angry at the believing men and women among the few who complained. He said to them two examples. He says, listen, from the people of the past who believed in the oneness of Allah. Among them were people who used to be tortured back in the day with previous prophets, previous nations. They used to have, get combs, not regular combs where you comb your hair. It combs their skin. That comb peels the flesh, ple peels the veins and the bones appear. They, that does not let them renounce their faith. That, that does not let them sacrifice their faith and they become steadfast. From the people in the past, second and last example, he says, they had a hole dug in the ground for them. They would place the individual in there and they would cover up with the sand. They get a saw, a saw, and they go through the head and cut it into two halves and they don't let go of their religion. Then the prophet says, listen, a time will come where peace and security and this religion will prevail in this area to the extent that a person can travel from Hadramaut in Yemen all the way to Sana'a and that person will feel safe. How is he saying that? At the weakest point in the nation of Muhammad, at the weakest point you're saying that? How is it even possible? There's a promise from Allah the Creator. Safety will prevail because there's a lot of highway robberies. A believer will, can cross or anyone can cross. The Prophet said, but they will fear two things. They will fear Allah in terms of angering Allah and the other fear that they will have is a wolf attacking their sheep. That's it. He, they're hearing that. Then the Prophet concludes and he says, وَلَكِنَّكُمْ تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ But you guys are hasty. He said that to the, some of the companions. And many of us brothers and sisters are hasty here. Yes or no? Oh, I attended this lecture. I don't see what's happening to the ummah. Who can imagine that the believers are gathering and where is our honor? Where is our dignity? Wallahi, an animal dies in Brazil. He comes on the news. They take it serious. And a hundred believers die and they're not even referenced. Yes or no? Not even in a small font under the screen. We have no value. Animals have more value. I'm not exaggerating. That's what we in now. Yes or no? Yes or no? Treat it like that. What other nation, what other religion shows or goes through such severity? A whole camp of prison of hundreds of thousands of Muslims happening in the 21st century. It's getting bad. It's ridiculous. It's so obvious. Yes or no? It's way too obvious. May Allah protect us and forgive us. But you know when I say that, you know what I'm referring to? This is a good sign. Look at this weirdo. How is it a good sign? Allah revealed the verse. Allah says, do you expect that you will go to Jannah? Do you think you will enter into Jannah? Huh? And you go to see in Jannah, your house made of brick of gold and silver. You go to Jannah. You get to enjoy your beautiful family, all believers amongst them. You go to Jannah and you will never get sick and you never get old and you never die and you'll always be young. You go to Jannah and you meet wonderful people. You meet Ali and Khadija and Fatima. You go to Jannah and you meet the Prophet of Allah. You go to Jannah and you hear the Prophet reading the Quran. You go to Jannah and you see Allah. You want it just like that? That's what Allah saying. 
You want it just like that? Have you not known what happened to the past? People in the past, they had to be shaken to the core, shaken violently. Their faith had to be put to the test. When you go to do a driver, to get your driver's license, you study hard for a driving test. You don't really complain. You go you know, become a big doctor in your society. You do your MCATs, PCATs, DATs, whatever you name it. Why? Because no pain, no gain. I like that. and I, I, I encourage you. May Allah protect you. No pain, no gain. By why is it that some of us apply no pain, no gain in materialistic, worldly matters, but when it comes to religion, I don't want to face any single pain. Why? Why? May Allah protect us and forgive us. Say, I mean, struggle. I'm not a morning person. Wake up for Fajr. <laughs> what do you mean? I, I don't see myself really, you know, the heat of the weather, and I don't see myself, you know, going up for this prayer or do that obligate. Come on. May Allah forgive us, companions. You know Khabbab, the one who's saying this? That companion? His back was all torn apart. You know Khabbab, brothers and sisters? The leaders used to torture him by putting fire on the ground. Putting fire, fire. You know what turns off that fire? Khabbab's back. They put Khabbab, they throw him. They step on his chest and they make sure that fire is turned off with his back. His back is destroyed. But then, as I told you, this is a good sign. Why? Because Allah says, Ala inna nasrallahi qarib. That was the ending of the verse. Indeed, Allah's victory is close. So Allah's victory is very close when you reach maximum capacity of shaking. And because you know all, and we all know here, tests show your true color, yes or no? I might be a nice brother, Maj, but he's a pretty nice guy. You see me for two hours. <laughs> Right? Everything is good. Look at the service. Water, laptop, other do you want anything I can help you with? You, I got some VIP delivery pizza right in the back. You don't know who am I. You have no clue who am I. Just a little bit. But you go travel together. Who's going to pay for the food? And I get exposed being stingy maybe. You go scratch my car. I'll show you the real me. You step on my shoe. I don't know what I will do. I'm not good at poetry, but I just try to rhyme, you know? Right? Your true colors appear. I went, wallahi, true story. I shared that before. I was walking into a masjid, the place of worship. And as I was walking, I accidentally, I accident, wallah. I walked and I stepped on one guy's white puma shoes. You're like, how come you know it? Because he made me know it. <laughs> because when I stepped on it, he looked at me. He's like, what is wrong with you, brother Majid? I'm like, I'm so sorry, wallah, was by accident. He's like, you stepped on my white puma shoes. I said, brother, I, I was... He's like, what do you mean it was unintentional? I just bought these today, brother. I just bought these today. Brother, wallahi, I'm not praying. And he left the masjid. <laughs> May Allah guide him, say, I mean, I'm saying this today. Maybe I'll be the one who walks outside. Maybe he came back from another door and he prayed. I don't know. But I prayed to Allah to grant him the highest level of Jannah. And may Allah make him there and make me see him there with a the prophet with his white puma shoes. <laughs> I mean, Rabbi I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be all the, you know... Forget Puma, man, right? Go beyond that. But really, struggle. I know I went a bit hard on the tones. So I just kind of tried my best to kind of balance and extend. So just appreciate that struggle, but don't be hasty. Victory is coming. It's like, we, you know, when you throw something, this is the last illustration. It's like we're reaching the peak, and the moment you reach the peak, what happens? That's it. It's going to come, inshallah, wallahi, bi idhnillah, by the will of Allah, victory is on its way, inshallah. Inshallah. But be hasty. I mean, sorry, don't be hasty. Sorry. I just ruined it. Don't be hasty. Okay, don't be hasty. Remember when we flew? Remember when we flew the other time? I told you about what happens less than 25 years later. Remember? Okay, I'm going to fly again that same way. And the prophet said we're going to conquer. That, sorry, he said that Islam will prevail and conquer the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. Remember when I said that? This happened a few years after the prophet's death. He never said I will conquer, I will witness that. He said Islam will prevail. Why? Why was it a few years after that? You want to go research? Research a battle as an example, the battle of Yarmouk, to show you the Muslims. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, why? Like he, a few years after that, he died. A lesson the scholars teach us. For Allah to teach us all that victory of this religion is not associated to an individual. Even if that individual is the Prophet himself. Are you guys with me? 
So when you don't say, oh, this person died, I don't know what happens to Islam after him. Oh, this person, this lady, she moved on. I don't know how the masjid will continue to process their activities. No, if Islam were to die, it would have died with the death of the Prophet. So I said, yes or no? They kept going and they will keep going. So what I'm saying here is that we might all work hard. We work hard. And people, brothers and sisters, even this team of the ICD and those behind the scenes, presentation from family to, they worked hard and Allah knows best and may Allah grant them all the highest level in Jannah, say Ameen. But I want to tell you something, those who worked hard and everyone who attended, you may die and not see victory, but maybe your children will see it. May Allah grant us all victory, say Ameen. So moving forward, brothers and sisters, then they did that, the same thing to Bilal, radiallahu an. Bilal, oh, Bilal got it really bad. He was a Muslim, that's really bad, and he was black. How similar is the past with the present being black and Muslim and he was a slave his master tortured him put a massive rock on him just for him to say something Bilal just renounce the faith Bilal he sees Islam honors me as a slave as a black man I love that religion it encompasses someone like Abu Bakr the elite and it encompasses someone who is black and of the lowly in the sight of the people what religion is this of justice, of racial equality? This is the real deal. This has to come from the Creator. And the one who says that is none other than the most truthful Muhammad. I'm all in on this one. But being tortured. Brothers and sisters, check out this authentic statement. Most of the companions, most of them verbally renounced their faith, but they kept it in their heart. Among the few who remained was Bilal. It's okay, say it. No, because that's a higher level. So they torture Bilal, they make him topless, put him on the ground in the heat of the sands of Arabia, put a massive rock on him, renounce your faith. And he says, Ahadun Ahad, one God, one God. Look, Bilal is looking that it's Allah's right to be worshipped, not these idols. He wasn't really fighting for, oh, you guys shouldn't be doing this to me. No, Allah, Ahadun Ahad. Because you know what the narration says? Bilal looked upon this life, looked down upon this life. This life is temporary. That's what he says. This world is nothing. We're all going to die. But the real deal is the permanent life in the Akhirah. So the leaders got so angry. They told the kids, drag him across the city of Mecca. Make him regret his decision of not apostating and renouncing his faith. Then the kids, they came, dragged Bilal all over, all over, all over, dragging Bilal, bruising his body, breaking his bones, cutting his skin, and the whole streets of Mecca, what Bilal says, Ahadun Ahad, one God, one God, la ilaha illallah. Then the people of Christ got so angry, and they buried him with rocks, and he is about to die. The Muslims are trying, who comes in? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, a Muslim from the leaders. And he comes, he says to the master of Bilal, I want to buy him. What? I want to buy your slave, Bilal. It makes no sense. You buy slaves to do labor for you. Bilal can... Be, how can Bilal help you? Bilal can't even help himself. But he didn't verbalize that. Oh, you want to buy Bilal? Yes, I want to buy my brother. I want to buy Bilal. Okay. Five gold coins. An outrageous amount. Roughly, roughly. I tried to calculate it. Roughly speaking. It's about $130,000, roughly. A lot of money. Which makes no sense for someone who can't even help himself. That's it, deal. Five gold coins. That's authentic narration. The people, when they got the money, they mocked Abu Bakr. Look at this Abu Bakr. Look at this guy. Five gold coins, we got it. They tell Abu Bakr, hey, we were willing to negotiate 500% off, 500 off, up to one gold coin. Abu Bakr said, and I was willing to negotiate up to 100 gold coins. So, what is this? Isn't that a proof of prophethood that changes people in such way that the way Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr now is serving Bilal as if Abu Bakr is the slave and Bilal is the master. What religion is this? Bilal, when he, Bilal was bought, guess what Abu Bakr does? He doubles down on the greatness. He says, Bilal is a free man. He's no longer a slave. Allahu Akbar. Bilal walks as a free man. I'm no longer a slave. Brothers and sisters, 
We're coming close to the end of the session, and I know because Maghrib took a little bit of our time, I won't take much, inshallah, bi'ibdillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as you know, Maghrib took a significant amount. Just give me a few more minutes, inshallah. Brothers and sisters, the believers were suffering and suffering and suffering. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear, Allah's land is vast. Ardullahi wasi'ah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is about to advise the people. Some say it was basically revelation that tell the people who are being persecuted severely, emigrate. Emigrate where? The Prophet, peace be upon him, said. You guys with me? Focus. He says, go to Ard al-Habasha. Go to Abyssinia, Ethiopia today. Go travel. Go to the seashore. Get on a boat and go there. In Abyssinia, there's a king. A king that no one is oppressed in his presence. Brothers and sisters, that king is known as a Christian king. But no one is oppressed in his presence. He's just and fair. So he told the people amongst the believers, you guys go. What about you, Prophet of Allah? I'm staying. What will he face? I'm staying. Those who are struggling very much and can get away with it, run. Run. And the Prophet, he sends his own cousin. You know what they say? You, send your own, you don't even send your own children to the army, whatever the case is. The Prophet makes a statement. My own cousin is going with you, Ja'far. And guess who also goes? The daughter of Rasulullah, Ruqayya, and her husband, Uthman bin Affan. And they go and pay attention. It's not easy. It has to be in absolute secrecy. Because the people of Quraysh and the leaders, if they catch them in the middle of the night trying to escape, they will see this as treason. They will see this as you seeking support from another nation to destroy us. And we know very well in this country how dangerous that can be, right? When you seek a help from another country against your own country, right? Right? So to them, if this happens, we will do whatever it takes to deem that it's now applicable for us to kill you because you can, in a way, be betrayed. You're a traitor. So the believers, very silently, secretly, packing up their stuff. It's a long journey. Traveling on a camel from Mecca all the way to the seashore, cross the Red Sea, and go all the way to Africa. In the midst of all of that, brothers and sisters, one of the ladies, she was preparing her camel, her stuff. Her husband went to go and finish some few things. And as she was getting ready, she got on her camel, and she started to go. Someone stops her. Someone massive someone who's known to be amongst the most oppressive people to believers someone who didn't have even mercy to his own sister he catches her and it's none other than Umar ibn al-Khattab he stands and he tells her Aina ya Umm Abdullah Umm Abdullah where are you going and look so another role model get ready sisters oh, Umm Abdullah here we go she looks him in the eye and says laqad aida itumuna you guys tortured us. And we will leave this place and go to another land that belongs to Allah. Where we don't get persecuted the way you guys are doing it to us. Are you not worried, sister, what Umar will do to you? Die with honor and not humiliation. Allahu Akbar. Then Umar softens up and he tells her, Sahibakum Allah. May you be protected. May God be with you. What? Then he walked away. Um Abdullah was like, what was that? Guess who comes? Her husband. I'm like, ready? He's like, you know what just happened? What happened? Omar came to me. Oh, you're still alive. <laughs> right? Omar came to me. And he came and he said, where are you going? And I told him, I'm going to leave this persecution you guys are causing us. And we're going to go to another land for safety. And he told me, may Allah be with you. May God be with you. Her husband cut her off. Wait, woman, whoa. The way you're speaking indicates to me that you are hinting that Omar's heart softened up and would accept Islam. That's why you're making me feel like, woman. He's saying that because it's just outrageous. She says, Can't qalb. Yes, his heart softened up. He said, listen, listen. I swear to God, wallahi. The donkey of Umar will say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah before Umar says it. Let's keep going, let's keep going. You gotta appreciate that fact of our wonderful sisters. May Allah guide us all to the right path. Say, I mean, she felt it. Man, that's why our mothers are different than our fathers, right? Mother's like, Where were you? How, like, how did you know I did something wrong? Like, how is it even possible? Prophethood ended with Muhammad. Like, how do you get to know revelation, right? Just a sixth sense Allah blesses with them. Allah alam, Allah knows, but let's proceed, let's proceed. So then they travel. Umar bin Khattab, brothers and sisters, he says in, 
and the narration is pushed all the way to being sound. And what I'm sharing with you is the soundest and most authentic that I'm aware of. Umar al-Khattab, he says, and we'll end with his story. He says, I go and I chill, you know, pretty much at night. And he says, I was very much into alcohol and beer, all that type of stuff. I was really into it. And, he, and him, Umar al-Khattab, he wants to go hang out with his friends, like every night. As he's walking at night time to gather with his friends, check him out, he gets shocked. Lam ajidhum. No one was there. Then he says, you know what? Since no one is down to drink tonight, I'm going to go to the beer store directly. Ila al-khammar. So he says, I went to the beer store, the alcohol store. The owner was not there. What in the world was going on? He said, you know what? Since my friends drinking and all the, you know, that comes with the whole partying at night in the club is not available. And since the beer store is shut down, I'm just going to go pray to God. <laughs> That's exactly how it went, subhanAllah. He's like, then let me go and circulate around the Kaaba. Let me go pray. And brothers and sisters, if you see hints, your browser froze, slow connection, you're about to enter a bad website, maybe it's a hint from God. Allah Alam, He loves you, He cares for you. Let's proceed. Allah knows best. He's coming, He says, let me just go circulate around the Kaaba. At night time. As He was coming, Guess who he saw? The Prophet, peace be upon him, praying. So he said, you know what, tonight, I'm going to check out what his message is all about, actually. <laughs> so he says, I want to get so close to him and see, like, okay, what, you, what, are you, what are you saying? But he says, if I come, I will freak him out. It's Umar. So then Umar, if the Prophet was praying this way, brothers and sisters, think of it as a big structure, right? It's a Kaaba. Umar came from the side and he said, I went between the curtain and the bricks of the Kaaba. You with me? So the Kaaba is actual bricks covered by a curtain. So then Umar, the Prophet, if the Prophet was praying this way towards the Kaaba, Umar, he went this way. And he kept walking and walking and walking and walking and walking and walking right exactly where the Prophet was praying. And the only thing that is between Umar and the Prophet was what? Was the curtain of the Kaaba. And he, he said that so slowly. What does this guy have to say? So look what he says. I heard and I heard the Quran. I heard the Quran and I heard the Quran. And I realized it's the truth. فبكيت, and Umar cried. Umar cried. And he says, وَدَخَلَنِي Islam, And Islam entered my heart. And he said, I didn't want to finish. I did not want to finish in terms of going away. I wanted to keep hearing it. So I kept standing until the Prophet finished his prayers. But Umar, first day of being a Muslim. First day of being a Muslim. And we're going to talk only about day one. That's it. We're done. First day of a Muslim. He wakes up. He wants the world to know. Just like how the world knew that he was an oppressor that he was torturing Muslims, he wants the world to know that he is now a Muslim. Allah, brothers and sisters, you have to give this a minute. A man who had such a heart, so rough and rigid, so rough and rigid, you have to know what's the secret behind softening of the heart. It was nothing other than the Quran. So if you're someone who just cannot submit, struggling, you have such low point in your life. You're such a rough, rigid person. You lack mercy, whatever you want to call it. The first cure before spending the million bucks or whatever you have to go through, just make sure you read the Quran. The Quran cracked that lock that was locking his heart. Locks in the heart. You want to unlock your heart. You want to have life. You want to be full of life, go back to the Quran and no other response, no other options, no other person can give you a better response than that. This is the best thing to do. This has to be on the list as a step. Quran, learn it. Be associated with it to your best of ability. May Allah make you all people of Quran. Say Ameen. So Umar al-Khattab on day one, he goes asks the people, listen, who, is the big, who has the biggest mouth in all Mecca? What? Like who is the one who is known to transmit news faster than anything in the world? Like don't tell me no CNN or Fox or MSNBC or BB. I want, I want all that put together. They said, you got nobody except Jamil. Jamil Al-Jumahi, go find this guy. And he will go all around the city and tell him. He's like, okay. He goes to Jamil. 
Hey, Jamil. Huh? You can tell the attitude, right? What's up? Jamil, have you not heard? Look at Umar, huh? Have you not heard? What? I accepted Islam and I bear witness there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his slave and messenger. The narration that's authentic says, for Wallahi, like he didn't even ask him, like, are you kidding? Are you serious? Is this like a joke? Are you like, is this a prank? Or like, what's going on? What, what, uh, what's going on? So then Omar says, couldn't say anything because no question was asked. And this man start running. Like, you know, like with the sisters, if you have, let's say, Abai, you want to run fast, you do this and he ran. Ya Quraysh! He yelled, Quraysh! People are like, what is wrong with Jamil? Jamil's news today is not like any news. And wallah, it's not like any news. Because from today, Islam will not longer be the same. Ya Quraysh! People in the Mecca are like, what is wrong? What is wrong with you? Ya Quraysh! Laqad sabaa Umar! Umar became a deviant! Umar ran after him. He says, this guy is a liar. I didn't deviate. I went to the truth. And I bear witness, there's no one worthy of worship but Allah. And Muhammad is his slave and messenger. And he declares his Islam to everybody. People are like, what? You accepted Islam? This happened early morning. They jumped him. I'm not saying one, two, three, four. Don't worry about what you watched on TV or whatever. The reality, the authentic narration, they jumped him from all angles. They, so now self-defense. Umar, first one comes. Bam, knocks him out. Second one. Bam, knocks him out. Self-defense. Third one. Fourth. Fifth. He fights. How many rounds? Round one, two, three. Islam will no longer be the same after this day. Can you imagine the believers, the weak ones? Go, Umar. Knock him out, Umar. Right? I, go, I can feel them yelling from the heart, right? But they're still hiding. Oh, my God. Come on. You know, right? like, like, you know... Yeah, kind of sometimes the guilty feeling like stuff like that happened, like someone punch him, yeah, and like Astaghfirullah, whatever, and then he goes, punch him back and forth. And they fight and they fight. Not for an hour or two, because the hadith says Ghada, it happened in the morning all the way to about noon. Fighting. Then he got excited, uh, he got exhausted. Then he I know the cameraman doesn't like when I kind of go down, but see Allah for the Ummati, Ummati, my crowd. <laughs> then he was knocked out. And he told, and they were all sitting on him. <laughs> he says, it's either us, the believers, or you. It's do or die. He went back to go ahead and jump and fight. Then someone of elite status, he comes. He says, what in the world are you guys doing? Big shot. I believe it was Umayyah ibn Khalaf. He's like, yeah, Umayyah, yeah, oh leader. Have you not heard what Umar did? What did he do? He became deviant. And Umar said, he's like, they're liars. I became a Muslim. I testified there's no God worthy of worship, but Allah and Muhammad is a slave and messenger. Umayyah ibn Khalaf said, you, you guys, this man is a grown-up. He made the decision to accept Islam. What is, wow, really? What is the dipl diplomacy, mashallah, right? And then look what he says. It's not diplomacy. It's another way of diplomacy. He says, if you guys get rid of Umar, do you think his family will not seek revenge? Get off him. So the narration says, then they all got up. As if it was clothing. He was covered head to toe by the people. That's how many people had to put him down. And then he stands up. What in the world will Islam go through after that? What is day two and three and four and year one and year two? We will see you inshallah on November 8th. Thank you for your patience. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.